Our next fellow is Becca Sertner. Uh, she is an NOS Policy and Constituent Affairs Division Fellow, not OAR as is on the uh, uh, flyer. And she hails from Hui, um, Woods Hole Institute uh, at Sea Grant. And an interesting fact about Becca is that she is a British history aficionado. <laughs> Hope you guys are ready to switch gears from large animals in the Arctic to bacteria in the tropics. You're getting the full gamut of marine biology today. Um, so like James said, I'm going to be talking uh, to you guys today a little bit about my dissertation research, which I did at Northeastern University, um, the mitigation of white band disease in a crop or cervicornis by a quorum sensing inhibitor. Um, and I'd really like to thank Woods Hole Sea Grant and the Canal Scholarship for allowing me to be here today with you. Um, so I'd first like to start out really broadly and introduce the concept of a holobiont. Um, so a holobiont is a community of um, an assemblage of species that comprise an ecological unit. So basically a host and all of its uh, symbionts together. And within a holobiont, you have a microbiome. So the microbiome is simply the community of microorganisms on and within a host. Um, so basically all living things are holobionts. Humans are holobionts, as are corals. So these are some terms that I'm using throughout the talk. Um, so there are three main parts to the coral holobiont. First, we have the coral animal. Next, we have the symbiotic um, dinoflagellates known as zooxanthellae. And finally, we have the microbes. And the microbes include bacteria, archaea, viruses, et cetera, amongst other uh, microorganisms. And um, unlike zooxanthellae, we really know very little bit about this population of symbionts um, on coral. Um, so as most of you are probably aware, breakdowns in the relationship between corals and their zooxanthellae leads to bleaching. Um, the breakdowns in the relationship between corals and microbes lead to disease. And that is what I'm going to be talking about today. So along with overfishing and bleaching, coral disease is one of the biggest threats to coral reefs worldwide. Here are a couple diseases listed up here. Um, and as you can tell, coral biologists are extremely creative with naming their diseases here. Um, and so we don't know very much about diseases, but they are increasing in frequency and severity around the globe across almost every reef ecosystem. And um, they're just really not very well understood. Um, but they are correlated with climate change and other anthropogenic impacts. And actually, NOAA right now is doing a lot of work on coral disease. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that corals um, in Florida are not doing so well. There, um, there's a really large disease outbreak in Florida right now that's been going on for a few years. This uh, photo right here was taken from the Florida reef track. This brain coral um, is infected with what they are calling tissue loss disease. So today I'm going to be talking about white band disease, which is found also in Florida and throughout the rest of the Caribbean. Um, and while it's a little different, there's, there's some similarities across all the coral diseases. So keep in mind for what's going on in Florida. So white band disease affects the Caribbean acroporids. So Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata. And in 1979, an outbreak of white band disease led to the loss within about 10 to 15 years of over 95% of these really important reef building species um, throughout the Caribbean region. And again, like I said, we don't know very much about this, but we do know that white band disease is bacterial because it can be stopped with antibiotics as well as through filtration. And we also know that the disease is transmissible through the water column, um, through coral to coral contact, and through some animal vectors. There's also um, some evidence to show that coral heterotrophy of zooplankton, zooplankton might be a vector for this, for this disease. Um, that's what we're talking about today. And specifically, I'm gonna be talking about uh, cervicornis. All right, so this brings me to quorum sensing. Um, quorum sensing is the regulation of gene expression in a bacterial population in response to changes in bacterial cell density. And bacteria manage this through the production and secretion of signaling molecules called autoinducers. So at um, low numbers of bacteria, when a population of bacteria is young, there's only a few bacterial cells and they've only secreted a few autoinducers into the environment. And at this point, um, gene expression is off. There's not enough autoinducers in the environment to do anything. However, 
as the bacterial population grows, there's more and more bacteria um, in, in the colony. They're secreting more and more autoinducers. Um, so at some point, these autoinducers in the extracellular environment will cross a concentration threshold, at which point there are high enough concentration for the bacterial cells to recognize them. The autoinducers bind to the bacterial cells, initiate a signaling cascade, and this turns uh, gene expression on. So you can kind of think about this sort of complicated process as more autoinducers, gene expression is turned on. All right, so what are these autoinducers that I'm talking about? Um, they're the quorum sensing signaling molecules, and upon reaching some extracellular threshold concentration, they will bind to cells and regulate bacterial gene expression. Um, and Quorum sensing and autoinducers actually control a large variety of behaviors in bacteria, including virulence, um, biofilm production, antibiotic production, a lot of um, sort of more complicated uh, behaviors that a bacterial population will do. And um, there's a lot of different kinds of autoinducers. However, today I'm going to focus on the acyl homoserine lactones, um, which is basically, they all, they all, essentially look like this with a homoserine uh, lactone ring and an acyl chain of varying lengths. Um, and I'm going to work look at these because they are produced by a lot of known pathogens, which sort of like the most common type that a lot of people look at. All right, so this leads me to my research questions. Like I said, um, quorum sensing is a big player in virulence in a lot of bacterial species. So I thought to myself, maybe this could be involved in coral disease. So um, can the addition of autoinducer, so those molecules we talked about before, to healthy bacteria promote white band disease? Can we actually make white band disease or create disease by giving these bacteria um, sort of the molecules they need to turn virulent? So my experimental design, um, for my first experiment, healthy and diseased corals were collected from Bocas del Toro, um, Panama in 2014. And then um, I homogenized these corals, which is a really fancy way of saying something really low tech in that I put pieces of coral into a 50 mil falcon tube and I shook them <laughs> <laughs> really hard for a few minutes. And um, what you're left, it basically takes, strips all the tissue from the um, corals. So you're left with a skeleton, you remove the skeleton, and then you're left with this lovely slurry of coral tissue and bacteria. Um, so then I, I have my healthy and diseased uh, homogenates. I split, in that, I split that in half, so basically half were just left alone and then half were supplied with autoinducers. So I end up with uh, four treatments, healthy alone, healthy plus autoinducer, disease alone, and disease plus autoinducer. So then these four um, treatments were dosed onto healthy corals in aquaria. And um, this, I, I monitored the healthy corals for disease signs over uh, two weeks. You can see the four treatments here. So these are the results from this experiment. Um, so on the x-axis here, we have average days to total tissue loss, which basically means days until the coral died. And on the y-axis, we just simply have the four treatments. So what we can see here is that the two top treatments, the treatments that got the disease bacteria, the corals in those treatments experience full mortality within fewer than four days, perhaps not surprising. Um, and then in the uh, coral treatment that only got um, healthy bacteria alone, those corals lived till the end of the experiment, the full two weeks. So what's really interesting is this treatment right here. So corals that were supplemented with healthy bacteria plus autoinducer experienced full mortality in 5.28 days, which is not as fast as the disease treatments, but it's certainly significantly different than the corals that just got healthy bacteria alone. So what this says to me is that autoinducer has the ability to change a um, healthy bacteria population into a white band disease vector. So can the addition of autoinducer auto to healthy coral bacteria promote white band disease? My research indicates yes. Um, so moving on, there are also these molecules called quorum sensing inhibitors. And these are autoinducer antagonists, which sort of means that they're, they're the opposite of autoinducers. Um, so instead of when an autoinducer binds to bacteria, initiates its signaling cascade and starts gene expression, when QSIs bind to bacteria, they block that receptor, like you see here. So they stop that cascade from going forward and, they, and gene expression does not occur. Um, so 
I'm going to look at this one specifically right here, which is a brominated furanone, but I'm just going to call it a QSI. And um, these actually occur naturally and were first discovered in a red algae, but I got them from Sigma Aldrich. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second part of my research question is, can the addition of QSI to disease coral bacteria inhibit disease? So kind of the opposite of my first question. Um, so basically the experimental design of this uh, experiment was pretty similar. I collected diseased corals from Bocas del Toro, Panama in February of 2015. And I actually just use a counterpart of seawater for this because homogenizing takes a really long time. And um, I was more interested in, in the disease population rather than the healthy. So again, um, homogenized, we got our disease slurry and our seawater. These were split in two, seawater by itself, disease by itself. Um, and then the second half was given um, QSI. So we have seawater alone, seawater plus QSI, disease alone, and disease plus QSI. Again, uh, these four treatments were dosed onto healthy corals in aquaria, and um, I monitored the corals for disease signs over about a week. So here are the results from this experiment. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the four treatments. So we have seawater minus QSI, our double control, seawater plus QSI, um, disease minus QSI and disease plus QSI. And on the y-axis, we just had the proportion of corals that got infected with the disease. So the larger the bar, the more coral death in that treatment. So we see, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, that the corals that just got seawater had pretty good survivorship, not too much in this one. Um, and also, again, unsurprisingly, we see corals that were given disease by itself all experience full mortality, actually, in this case, within 36 hours. The really interesting piece, again, is sort of this combination. Corals that were given disease plus QSI basically all stayed healthy throughout almost the entire experiment. In fact, only one of the 15 corals in this treatment died, and it's my personal opinion that it wasn't really from disease, <laughs> um, but it still died, so we have to count it. But again, this was extremely significantly, um, extremely significant. Um, so basically what this says to me is that QSI has the ability to prevent white band disease transmission. So can the addition of QSI to disease coral bacteria inhibit white band disease? Again, my research indicates yes. So now that we know that quorum sensing is probably involved in white band disease transmission, um, I was interested in looking at what the actual bacteria were that these autoinducers and these QSIs were working on. So in order to do this, I did some 16S um, rRNA sequencing. And, um, Basically, what this is, um, is that all bacteria have a 16S rRNA gene. It's highly conserved throughout bacteria. However, within that highly conserved gene, there's a hypervariable region, which means um, that it uh, varies widely between bacterial species. Um, so you can basically tell what bacteria are there by sequencing part of this gene. Um, so you can do phylogenetic studies uh, with this um, because this sequence will correspond to this vector as this sequence will correspond to uh, another vector and it's always in the same place. Um, so I wanted to ID using 16S um, disease associated bacteria as well as healthy associated bacteria. I'm just gonna quickly go over what I did bioinformatically in case anyone is interested in that, but um, mm -hmm. I can talk about that more after. Basically, um, I extracted all DNA. I did a multiplex 16S library prep and I sequenced the V4 region of this gene. Um, I then uh, took that to uh, an Illumina sequencing platform. I used the HiSeq platform. Um, I used Chime um, to remove low quality reads and cluster the reads at 97%. I ended up with about uh, 4,200 OTUs, which is a fancy way of saying bacterial species. Um, I then did differential abundance analysis with the R package metagenome seq. Okay. <laughs> um, so this should look familiar to you. Um, this is basically within my QSI addition experiment, I did the 16S sampling. So in addition to just watching the corals for getting disease signs, I also was taking bacterial samples. So I did that at three time points, uh, time point zero, which was before, basically after they came out of the fields after 24 hours, just to get a baseline to make sure nothing was weird about um, the corals, if they were already sick or something like that. Um, I took a, uh, time point one, which is 12 hours post dosage. That was before any disease signs started to show in the corals that would get disease. So they all appeared healthy, but they had already been dosed. And um, a time point two at 24 hours post dosage. So at, at that time point, the corals in the disease treatment were starting to show disease signs. They were starting to have a phenotypic response. 
So again, just to remind you of the four treatments, we have minus disease, minus QSI, all the corals in this treatment remained healthy for several days. We have minus disease plus QSI, again, corals in this treatment also remained healthy. Minus disease, or plus disease minus QSI, the corals in this treatment all died super fast within about 48, 36 hours. And we're our plus disease plus QSI treatment. And again, the corals stayed healthy here. Um, so also these colors are now going to correspond to the rest of my figure. So try and remember which colors go with what. <laughs> um, okay, so my first result here is my uh, principal coordinate analysis plot. Um, basically, this shows the four treatments at 24 hours post dosage. And for those of you unfamiliar with this type of plot, each dot is a coral microbiome. So each dot represents one coral from the tanks and all the bacteria in it. So the closer two dots are together, the more similar the microbiomes, and the further apart two dots are, the more different the microbiomes. So what we see here, again, got a helpful little uh, uh, list down here. The um, black are the full control. The blue uh, dots are the minus disease plus QSI. The red dots are the plus disease minus QSI, the corals that got disease and the purple dots are the plus disease plus QSI. So we see that um, corals that got disease, the red dots are clustering away from the healthy corals, the um, black and blue. That's not surprising. We know they got disease. There must be something different about their microbiome. Um, it's good to see that it actually happened though. What is really interesting is that the purple dots are clustering with the black and blue which basically says to me that not only is QSI preventing white band disease transmission, it's actually taking a disease microbiome and turning it healthy. In fact, the purple microbiomes are statistically indistinguishable from the um, microbiomes of the control corals. It's just taking away the disease. So this is just simply supported by Permanova. Okay, so now I'd like to focus on the specifically the disease corals versus the QSI rescued corals. Um, so again, remember, the red is the plus disease minus QSI corals, and the purple is the plus disease plus QSI corals. So corals that got disease, corals that were QSI rescued. So what this plot shows is the OTUs, again, bacterial species, that um, are statistically differentially abundant between those two treatments. So basically, which bacteria are in, are more or less in these treatments. So um, on the x-axis here, we just have the number of OTUs, number of bacterial species, and on the y here, we have uh, bacterial families. So what we can see here is that corals that got disease, um, we have an abundance of Vibrios, Flavobacteria, um, Altermonodaceae, Coeliaceae, and Rhodobacteriaceae. And for those of you who know about coral disease, these are sort of the usual suspects. Um, we see these pretty much across the board um, in a lot of ecosystems in diseased corals. Um, and uh, this one is a bit of a new one, the Flavobacteria, but I've, we've seen that in Panama a lot, which is interesting to keep an eye on. Um, and another interesting piece is that there were more bacteria that were more abundant in diseased corals. However, we did see a standout of Endozoicomonas as more abundant in healthy corals. So keep that in mind. Um, so let's talk about the white band disease causing bacteria, specifically the Vibrios and the Flavobacteria. So how you can read this figure, we have the Vibrios and the Flavobacteria. On the x-axis here, we simply have the three time points. So post uh, pre-dosage time zero, which you can kind of ignore, it's just a control. Um, time point one and time point two, so that's the pre, uh, both post-dosage time points. And on the y-axis, we have, it's a little hard to see, so I'm sorry, um, the four treatments, but they are corresponding to the colors again, so you can see that. Um, so what we see here is the larger the circle, basically that means there are more bacteria of this kind in that treatment. So bigger circles means more bacteria, smaller circles, less bacteria. So what we see here is that Vibrios and Flavobacteria are more abundant in white band disease microbiomes. So these large red circles, really a lot of those types of bacteria um, in, uh, in the time points one and two for diseased corals. Again, this sort of corresponds to what I've been showing you before. Um, and these are then less common in the uh, QSI supplemented microbiome. So we have a lot of Vibrios and Flavobacteria in disease corals and um, much fewer in the QSI rescue corals. 
So what does this basically say? The only difference between these two treatments was quorum sensing inhibitor. So basically, we can take away from these results that these taxa, vibrios and flavobacteria, and along with the other three that I mentioned before, are specifically inhibited by QSI. So QSI is basically, when that's added, it takes these families away. We're not really sure if it's killing them or it's preventing them from growing, what it's doing exactly, but it's taking them away. So now I wanna focus a little bit on the symbionts, the endozoic monas. Um, so again, same exact setup as before, um, except we're looking at endozoic monas and actually a related family called Halomonodaceae. Um, again, we see that endozoic monas and Halomonodaceae are less abundant in white band disease microbiome. So you can see that from sort of the smaller red circle there. Um, but these taxa dominate um, the QSI rescued corals as well as the healthy corals, especially the healthy corals. So again, the only difference between corals that got disease and these QSI rescued corals was the QSI. So we're seeing that while the QSI is inhibiting diseased species, bacterial species, we see this actually helping to maintain um, potential putative coral symbionts like endozoicomonas and halomonodaceae. And what's interesting is actually endozoicomonas is sort of coming out of the literature recently as a potential coral symbiont across the world. A lot of people are finding that in healthy corals, they're dominated by these endos. Um, and just a little bit more about vibrios and flavobacteria. Um, vibrios are gram-negative gamma proteobacteria. They're extremely common marine pathogens. Um, and they're linked to many diseases, including corals. The, so that's not surprising. But the flavobacteria are a little interesting. They're also gram-negative, which pathogens tend to be, but they're from um, totally different phylum, Bacteroides. And um, they haven't really been showed, except in a couple of my papers, um, to be associated with coral disease. Um, but they are, um, uh, they are opportunistic pathogens of freshwater fish. So who knows what's going on there, but they <laughs> seem to be in the corals as well. Um, so what does this mean for mitigation? Tying it a little bit back to what is happening at NOAA. Um, so in Florida, Specifically, um, managers are using chlorine and broad spectrum antibiotics to treat disease coral. Um, however, these methods are indiscriminate bacterial killers. Um, if you put broad spectrum antibiotics or chlorine into bacterial population, it's gonna kill everything there. Um, however, from my work, we've sort of seen that we maybe don't wanna kill everything that's on the coral. We maybe wanna maintain these symbionts. So um, potentially it would be possible to target specifically disease-causing species with QSI, because um, it inhibits pathogens like vibrios and flavobacteria and rhodobacteria and preserves symbionts like endozoicomonas. So right now, Cheryl Woodley from NCOS is using a dental paste with antibiotics in it to apply directly to uh, disease corals. Maybe it could be something that's tried with QSI. Maybe it could be tried in the field on disease corals, but something to think about for the future. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the many people who helped me out with this research, um, my, uh, my old lab and a bunch of other people from my old lab, as well as um, the Canal Scholarship and Huey C. Grant. And with that, I would love to take any of your questions. <laughs> Shante. <laughs> In terms of so this, your study area, um, when you look at your the colonies of coral that you were testing, you did a lot of lab work to show relationships. So how would you relate the relationships you found to the fact that corals have genetic distribution across broad ranges that may um, change the relationship between the different types of bacteria that will go with those genetic related groups. And that's usually following this larger current, the larger um, project, uh, in terms of genetic relatedness among populations. Yes. And if your, your relationship between QSI and symbionts um, not being able to um, having an effect that is potentially different, if those genetic relationships change. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, um, how does coral genotyping basically affect um, these results? Is 
so there's some studies that suggest that coral genetics have to do with what bacteria are on those corals. Is that mostly what you're asking? So would this work for, for many genotypes of coral? Right. right. Okay. So in my auto-inducer addition experiment, I actually controlled for genotypes. So I used um, multiple fragments of the same genotype and, I, and it, it worked. And then basically because controlling for genotype is a big pain in the butt, I, um, for my second experiment, I specifically took a large reef and I collected all different genotypes. Um, so basically my collection method, I, I would go to a, a giant patch of cervicornis that had was all over the reef and I would um, collect fragments from different individuals so that were at least one to two meters apart. Um, so we know that the corals I've collected just sort of based on some research that other people in my lab have done were as unrelated to each other as they could be while staying in the same geographic area and it seemed to have the same trends um, with all of them. So genotype, while it does have an effect on what bacteria are there, um, it's a complicated question, sometimes um, there are some constants. So healthy corals, despite their genotype, tend to have a lot of endozoicomonas. Um, disease corals, despite their genotype, you will find vibrios and flavobacteria on them. Um, if you're interested in that work, my lab mate actually did a, a lot on coral genotype. I didn't focus on it as much, but um, I have not done this outside of Panama, but you know, my PhD could be 10 years long. I guess that's what I would try <laughs> next. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any data on the effects of the genotype on I have um, a PCOA plot at, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, do I have a PCOA plot at time zero and 48 hours? I do. Um, I have a PCOA plot at zero, 12, um, 24, and 36 hours that I don't have here. The PCOA plot, I'll describe them at zero hours. They're all just together. Um, and the PCOA plot at 20, 12 hours looks essentially the same, which is why I didn't include them. If you're interested to look at those, I actually um, published this earlier this year. Um, and you can look at the three time points as well, some descriptions of what happened after. But yeah, so at time zero, they're all together. They're all statistically indistinguishable. And, um, what are the natural sources of QSI? So QSI was first discovered in a red algae called uh, Delicea pulchra. Um, so it actually has been found in a number of seaweeds and algae, and it um, the basically the very few studies that have looked at this um, when seaweeds and algae are being colonized by bacteria, they, they produce this QSI and it inhibits swarming behavior in some potential pathogens. Um, I did not purify it myself. I would not know how one would go about doing that, but you can actually buy it in its purified form um, from chemical companies. They, um, quorum sensing is a big um, study in uh, human, especially in cystic fibrosis, so they, they make these things um, for clinical microbiology, so I just sort of co-opted. Some of the things that people use. Uh, second part to that question, um, you may not know this, but um, are there processes that should be producing QSI um, that are breaking down leading to the disease? So the question was, are there processes that are um, producing QSI? Um, so QSIs and autoinducers are only produced by bacteria. However, um, it is my personal opinion that potentially what is going on um, when corals get disease is they lose some of their good bacteria. They lose their symbionts. And maybe those symbionts are making some QSIs naturally to keep away the vibrios and the flavobacteria. And for whatever reason, when the corals get stressed um, from climate change or from pollution, we lose some of these good bacteria and then they can get disease. Um, but yes, they are naturally produced by bacteria. Bacteria are constantly at war with each other. They're always trying to kill their neighbors and grow up themselves. So <laughs> yeah, this is a really not well um, explored area of micro, especially environmental microbiology, but I'm confident that that is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all that who joined us uh, in the library today, and then thank you to those that joined us online. Uh, we look forward to 
Um, any of your questions in the long term, if you have any follow-ups later, uh, feel free to contact us. And also uh, look forward to seeing you at future Ground Thank you. Yeah.